think I can talk and chew gum at the same time here. Let's see. So I'm a member of the Richmond board, and um, I was asked to speak today by Charles. So I want to start with a definition of patriot. And a patriot is a person who vigorously supports their country and is prepared to defend it against enemies and detractors. So Charles thought it would be a good idea to, for someone to provide a historical family narrative as part of this ceremony. And I drew that short straw. So since we're here at Patriots Park, my narrative theme is patriotism. So now let me tell you a little bit about my family. Thank you. Because if you've looked at the wall on the third panel on my over my left shoulder, third panel from the left, you'll see a bunch of names of people with the last name Gardner. So my family, on my family side, uh, it has deep roots in the state of Rhode Island. I'm the son of Lloyd, who's the son of Ralph, who is the son of Avaldo, who is the son of Benjamin. All of us were born in the region known today as Washington County. The earliest known of them, Avaldo and Benjamin, were born in North Kingstown. I lose the trail there. But, as I just pointed out, there are several people memorialized here with whom I share a last name. I've tried to determine whether I'm a descendant of one of these patriots, and there are more than I'm going to mention now, but some of them are Cuff Gardner, Sharper Gardner, Mintel Gardner, Rudy Gardner, Primus Gardner, Hercules Gardner, George Hunter Gardner, and they were most of them, I think I just named one person who was free at the time. But all of them were slaves of the Gardner's family who lived on what was then South County. And that included South Kingstown, Exeter, and North Kingstown. So since I haven't been able to make that case, there is a missing piece of the puzzle for me to be able to make a connection to one of those people. But it turns out I have a different connection to one of the names on this monument. And that connection is based on a decision my mother and father made to move our family to East Greenwich, to a house purchased by Ichabod Northup in 1816. So I grew up in that house for my teenage years. And because of this connection, I'm going to talk about Ichabod Northup, a former slave, a member of the Rhode Island Regiment memorialized here at Patriots Park. I believe Ichabod's experience would likely have been similar to my earliest ancestors' experience here in America. So when I focus on what we know about Ichabod, I realize we pick up the story in the middle of his life. We know nothing about his parents, his grandparents, or the early part of his life. We only know Ichabod was born a slave in North Kingstown around 1745. And that he, by virtue of being born a slave in Rhode Island, actually didn't have the experience of being thrust into the slavery pipeline while still on the African continent. Well, what do I mean by that? All of us are familiar with the images of ships anchored off the coast of Africa, packed with Africans, arranged tightly from bow to stern, port to starboard like cargo, for transport across the Atlantic, for the journey popularly known as the Middle Passage Voyage. Even that doesn't capture the initial moment of enslavement. It's something I think about from time to time because that was likely the experience of my earliest African ancestors. So I recently came across an article discussing the African slave trade. It chronicled the experience of Africans who were captured and sold into slavery on the African continent. For many, it began
began near a village somewhere inland with a moment of terror. Captors snatched away lives, many of them young boys and girls. And through the use of force, the captors were bound with shackles, chained together, and marched down the coast, leaving everything they knew behind. The trek to the coast took as long as three months. Starvation, dehydration, disease, and physical abuse by the captors were all threats to their survival. If they were lucky to survive the journey, they earned the opportunity to spend another three months in overcrowded, unsanitary, and disease-infested dungeons in one of the castles. The value of their lives, measured in some amount of rum, pork, beef, tar, flour, tobacco, sugar, trinkets, and other goods brought from the Americas. Reaching the coast meant they reached the point of no return, and their fate was death or a life of enslavement in America. At least one of them would be the first ancestor of Ichabod North to arrive in America, just like my first to arrive here. So now fast forward to 1776 in North Kingston. There lived Emmanuel North, who at one time or another during his life was a sheriff, a judge, a politician, and a slave owner who owned 10 slaves. He lived in a house on a farm on the southern side of the Anaquintucket River that was built by his father in 1690. The house still stands today. North Kingstown was part of what was then South County, the home of a class of successful farmers, sometimes called Narragansett planters who resided on large farms, owned slaves, and raised, among other things, dairy cows, sheep, and horses. Their farm products were frequently purchased by Newport merchants, who in turn sold the products in the Caribbean to sustain slave populations there. Emmanuel's slaves included Ichabod North. Ichabod would have been about 31 years old in 1776. The year the United States declared its independence. At that point, he had been a slave his entire life. The Revolutionary War changed Ichabod's fate. It was General James Mitchell Barnum of East Greenwich who asked General George Washington to allow Rhode Island to raise a regiment of African and Native Americans, with Rhode Island paying slave owners to release their slaves to the state to serve in a new regiment. If they survived, they would earn their freedom. And General Washington acquiesced. Ichabod was one of those slaves enlisted into the Continental Army in 1778. He, had, he and the other newly freed slaves began their training as soldiers at Academy Field in East Greenwich. These soldiers finished their training in time to participate in the Battle of Rhode Island. The Black Regiment, as it has been called, achieved immortal fame that day as they withheld repeated charges by professional Hessian soldiers. But Ichabod's luck didn't hold. The British captured him on August 4, October 14, 1781. He was held prisoner of war in New York until the war ended. He was released by the British and came home in October 1783. He was 38 years old at the time. Over the next several years, he married, raised a family, and worked hard as a laborer to support them. By 1816, he had saved enough money to purchase that house on Division Street in East Greenwich, two blocks away from General Varnum's house and one block from Academy Field. He and his family lived in the home for several years. He died at the age of 78. His obituary referred to him as a man of color and faithful soldier in the Revolutionary War. In 1833, his heirs sold the house to Solomon Fry, another, well, actually the son of another Revolutionary War veteran, Windsor Fry, who was also listed on that third panel from the left, my left. 
in, a, in 1857, Solomon Fry and his wife sold the house to their daughter, Emmeline Fry. In 1903, my great aunt Emma Ammons acquired the property. She was the daughter of Gideon Ammons, a prominent tribal leader of the Narragansett Indian tribe during the mid to late 1800s. The house has been owned by my family since that time. Bruce McGonagall of East Greenwich wrote an article in 2013 from which I have shamelessly borrowed to tell some of this story, and it is titled, Small Home as History Tied to American Revolution. But I dare say the story is much bigger. It also has a history tied to World War II through my father and his brothers, all of whom owned the house at one point. My father was one of four sons. The younger youngest of these brothers is still alive. And he recently told me that on the day Japan bombed Pearl Harbor, he was in the living room of that house with his parents, Ralph and Moore, my grandparents, listening to the news on the radio. And suddenly his mother began to cry because she knew then that her three sons would be heading to war. My father Lloyd joined the Navy and his two brothers joined the Army and the Marines. It is tied to World War I through my grandfather Ralph, an Army veteran who served with the 807 Pioneer Infantry, and he once owned the house. It is tied to the Civil War through my great-great-grandfather Benjamin, a veteran of the Rhode Island Colored Heavy Artillery Regiment, who, who had a son who married Ella Ammons, the sister of Emma Ammons, who acquired the property in 1903, and that's how it came into our family. All of them were patriots. I'll quote Mr. McGonagall, who summed it up nicely when he wrote, the final piece of this historic story is that all the owners of this house since 1816 have been African American or Native American. And there are few houses in East Greenwich that claim such an historic and interesting story. I would add, they were all pan patriots. Our pursuit at Richmond is to help the public discover and learn about people, places, and events connected to Rhode Island slave history. This story reflects my own journey of discovery and is an example of the kind of history Richmond wants to invite the public to discover. We are excited about the placement of the first Rhode Island Slave History Medallion right here at Patriots Park and hope you will support our efforts to discover more about Rhode Island slave history and our goal to place more medallions 